Amen. I touch the sky when my knees hit the ground. We are so excited for these families and for these students as they come to this important step in their life, and it's exciting to hear uh, them talk about their future and that we've seen them grow in their past and where they stand. I tell you, Tyler looked like a thorn among the roses up here, didn't he? And uh, we are excited for uh, you and for your families. And uh, this morning, we're going to go back into our study of the book of Mark, but it fits just uh, hand in uh, glove with what is needed in the life of this important time. So I, I ask you to go back to the book of Mark, chapter 1. I just remind you, Mark is writing this. Uh, Mark is uh, giving the account of Simon Peter, as it was told to him, his mentor in the ministry. And he's writing to a Roman audience, and they love action. So uh, the most common the word in the book is the word uh, euthus, is a Greek word that means immediately. And so we have three rapid-fire events that just happen one after another, and you'll find that Mark just moves on to the next one, and he says immediately and immediately. So we'll pick up this morning and read in Mark chapter 1 and in verse 4. We'll do that immediately. Uh, Mark chapter 1 and verse 4. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair, wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. That's important to see there, not so much for us to know his fashion sense, but for us to understand that the voice of God has been silent for 400 years after the book of Malachi. And now then, God is bringing a word of preparation to Israel. And so John the Baptist is identified even by the way he dressed and by his diet and where he is and what he's saying as a prophet from God. That is a big deal. Verse 7, it says, And he was preaching, saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And in those days Jesus came from Nazareth and Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately, Coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him, and the voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. These three rapid-fire events paint for us a picture of an example of who Jesus is and an example for our life. Jesus is baptized as an example of surrender to the will of his Father. He told them in John chapter 4, he said, my meat is to do the will of the Father. Jesus wanted to be obedient to the plan that God the Father had set, and so the baptism, as John has offered it, Jesus was not there to be baptized because he was repenting of his sin. He was submitting to the will of his Father. And then as he was... Uh, there to be baptized, and as he comes out, up out of the water, the Bible says that the heavens open. It's a very peculiar Greek word that is used there. It literally is a dramatic word. It's almost a picture of violence as you hear that the heavens are ripped open. It is a dramatic scene that the heavens are ripped open, and then the voice of God speaks, and it gives that divine confirmation that Jesus is the Son of God and that God is pleased with him. And then, as you see in this dramatic fashion, you almost expect something dramatic to happen, but it says that the Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove descends, and it is a beautiful picture of God's grace in our life. Whenever you ought, ought to expect some violent act of judgment should befall us, whenever God speaks from heaven, you would almost expect that for us, but it's a picture of God's grace descending upon us in the, in the picture of the dove. And then with all these emotions, all this adrenaline, you just think from the human aspect, you think of the people standing there as they have been waiting for 400 years in silence, and now then John has been preaching that there's one who is coming. We, we don't hear it from Mark, but we hear it from the other Gospels. And John points out Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And people stand there and they watch as Jesus is baptized, 
and the dramatic forces that are in play when the heavens are ripped apart and they hear the voice from heaven that de declare that Jesus is the Son of God and that God is pleased. And then they see Jesus. I mean, it's almost like, it's a bad comparison, but, but it's almost like the picture in a locker room before a ball game. You see all the adrenaline that flows and all that is prepared and all that's ready. But what does Jesus do? Jesus goes into the wilderness. He's about to launch his earthly ministry, and now then this stage is set, and it says that he withdraws, and he goes into the wilderness for 40 days, and he's tempted. I think for our students that we celebrate with you today, but also for every believer who is here, there's a lesson for us to learn. And what Jesus teaches us here, the scene is set for us to understand. And there are two lessons. The first one is this. You were never ready to stand for Jesus in public until you are willing to bow before God in private. Jesus had the stage set. Everybody saw, everybody heard. The word would spread from there. And if Jesus would have performed some miraculous sign that he would do later, don't you know how the, how the, the grapevine would have worked through the land? But instead, Jesus withdrew, and he spent some time alone. How important that is. And for our students that are about to go off to college especially, you're going to be faced with certain temptations. And if you don't learn this spiritual discipline in your daily life, then you will not be prepared to stand. If you're not willing to bow before God in private, you will not be ready when the time comes for you to stand for God in public. That's true for myself. That's true for every one of us. We're not ready to stand for God publicly. We're not ready to stand in the heat of the moment until we've been willing to bow before him in private. There's some spiritual disciplines that are taught here. And I'm going to deal with three of them. Uh, there's solitude, silence, fasting, and praying. I'm just going to touch on those. I'm not going to say a whole lot about prayer. I think prayer is the primary one. But we've spent a whole series of sermons talking about prayer. Prayer is uh, so important into our daily life. But I think sometimes we don't give enough attention to understand why did Jesus pull aside. The first one is the spiritual discipline of solitude. Solitude, if you define it, it is the purposeful abstaining from contact with other humans. It has a purpose. It is intentional. It's not just going off to be alone. It has a spiritual intention with it. Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6, he says, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room. Get along. Go into your closet. Close the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will, will reward you. We are never ready to go serve God out publicly until we're willing to draw aside into our closet and spend that time in a quiet time. And I would encourage you Practice this discipline every single day. Set aside a time to draw apart from this world and get away from everybody else and spend only that time with God. Spend only that time in meditation on His Word, in reading His Word, in prayer, alone with God, because you will not be prepared. You will not be spiritually disciplined to be able to confront all that you'll front, confront when you're in the crowd until you spend that time daily. The Bible says in Psalm 46 and verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. I will exalt the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. But until you come to that time, you're going to be distracted by everything in the world, and you can... Most of you woke up to an alarm clock this morning, and it was an alarm clock that said, This is important. You better get up out of bed. And you wake up to an alarm clock almost every morning that says it's time to get up. And what happens when you get up out of bed? Then you hit the ground running. Now, some of y'all, I don't want to be around you till you've had two or three cups of coffee. I, I've just learned that through the years. But we make life so busy. And we get busy with life. We get busy, and we're always running. We're always going. We're always around other people. We get in the car. We turn on the radio. We get home. We turn on the television. We listen to the news. It's going 24 hours a day. There's some music in the background. There's something going on, and our minds are always running. There's a time when we need to just be still. I'm ashamed to say, but there are some days whenever I get in the bed and realize 
that from my time that I had with the Lord early in the morning, that I didn't pause all day long and just get still with him. Some of y'all, this is the first time you've been still on this early Sunday morning. We need to get still with God. There is spiritual value in that. Dallas Willard, who is sort of the the, uh, go-to guy when you talk about spiritual disciplines, he wrote this. He said, the normal course of day-to-day human interaction locks us into a pattern of feeling and thought and action that are geared, geared to a world, it's geared to a world that is set apart from God. That's the world we live in. Paul calls it, we have a citizenship here, we have a citizenship in heaven, but we can get so earthly-minded that we're no heavenly good. We are geared toward this world. And he says that nothing but solitude can allow the development of a freedom from the ingrained behaviors that hinder our integration into God's order. Paul says this to the Romans. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's the least that you can do. And then in verse 2, he says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do you renew your mind unless you draw apart from this world? I read something that was fascinating to me. Um, scientists affecting, thinking of, of a sociological test, but using lab mice, they took 20 mice and, did, and they gave all of the mice amphetamines. And then they took one solitary mouse and put him aside. And they gave him amphetamines. They gave him drugs until they died. All of these mice together that they were running around in the maze together and they were busy together and they were all given the same amount as this mouse who was alone. They had to give him 20 times more than he gave to all those. I found that fascinating because sometimes we get caught up and sometimes our social patterns are just as deadly that we get caught up in what's going on with the world around us, and have you noticed just how quickly in our day and time a crowd can turn into a mob? And people get caught up into the, into the social gathering of it, and then they, whenever it goes negative, it goes negative for everybody, and it goes so quickly. And that's what Dallas Willard is saying, is sometimes we need to pull apart from the world even though we're trying to influence the world, that we need to spend some time alone with God. Solitude has, has its benefit to renew our mind. Thomas Merton said, Solitude is a terrible trial, for it serves to crack open and burst apart the shell of our superficial securities and to open us to the unknown abyss that we won't know until we get alone. As well, it, we discover that the abyss is haunted. Some of us don't want to be alone because we don't want to hear our conscience. We don't want to hear conviction. We don't want to be alone because we don't want to deal with our sin. And all that God wants to do is get that out of the way. And so whenever you come in prayer and say, God, I need this, and he says, yes, you sure do, but I tell you what, let's deal with your sin first. Well, God, no, I want to pray for somebody else. And he says, I'm going to take care of them. Let's deal with your sin first. Until the point that every time you come that you hear conviction to the point that you just stop praying. Oh, you sometimes go through the motions and say, God is good. Let's thank him for our food. That's about all that you do. Now lay me down to sleep. But you don't really be still long enough for God to speak into your heart. The Bible tells us that in that solitude that it enables us to renew our mind, to prove what is a good and perfect will of God, and it enables us then to be able to go out into our culture and our world and make a difference. Henry David Thoreau said this, As our inward quiet life fails, we go more constantly and desperately to the post office, but the poor fellow who walks away with the greatest numbers of letters, proud of his extensive correspondence, has not heard from himself for this very long time. Sometimes it is painful to draw aside, but God gave the example through Jesus. At the point when he was about to enter his earthly ministry and do all that the Father had said for him, God 
led him into the wilderness. I'm not saying that you've got to go off for 40 days, but I am telling you, you need to spend some time every day. And along with that, the second discipline is silence. That is almost impossible in our day and time. We were supposed to leave this afternoon to go on a little vacation, go see Emily. Now I just wasn't able to go, so my family left yesterday, and I was sitting at the house alone thinking about the sermon today and thinking about this and was going to just practice silence. You can't do that in West Point. I mean, I, I, I started listening, and I heard the talk cl- clock ticking, and uh, it's ticking all the time. It's just never quiet enough for me to hear it. And I heard a mockingbird. It's about to drive me crazy. because I, It's always going, but I, I just I don't get still along. I'm not quiet enough to hear it. And then I heard the humming of the motor on my computer. I heard the traffic as it went down the road, and I thought, how far into the woods would I have to go? You'd have to go a long way to get into silence, wouldn't you? But there are times that we need to draw apart from this world and we need to be quiet and we need to be still. It is rare in our culture. Henry Nouwen uh, said, Silence is frightening because it strips us of, of nothing like nothing else does. It throws us into the stark reality of life because it brings the reality of death. Silence sometimes is golden. Sometimes it's just scary. It makes you uncomfortable. Doesn't it? We're just not used to silence. But there are times when God tells us in his word, Isaiah 30 and verse 15, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, In repentance and rest you'll be saved, and in quietness and trust you'll find strength. Matter of fact, there are times I'll remind myself and I'll remind you that we are called to silence even when we're not in solitude. There's sometimes you just need to keep your mouth shut. James chapter 1 and verse 26 says, If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. There are times that you need to bite your tongue. That is a whole different subject, but that is a spiritual discipline. Solitude, silence, and then the third one is fasting. We're not told a lot of details uh, here from Mark, but we know comparing as well Matthew and Luke, that Jesus went into the wilderness, he was there for 40 days and 40 nights, and that he fasted. Now, fasting is not just missing a meal. Fasting, the definition of fasting would be uh, abstinence in a significant way from, from food, for a spiritual purpose. It's not because I'm on a diet, or not because I'm busy, or not because I missed a meal. That's not what he's talking about when he talks about fasting. And by the way, it's not a discipline we talk a whole lot about, but God still expects us to practice the spiritual disciplines. He tells us that when you give, he expects us to give. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand does. You do that to the Lord. He says whenever you pray, You do think that God means for you to pray. He still means for us to pray. That's not just an Old Testament principle. He said, but when you pray, go into your closet, get alone. And your father who will see in secret, you need to spend that time in prayer. And he says, when you fast, Matthew chapter 6 talks about when you fast. But he says, when you fast, don't put on a sad face and don't walk around and say, whoo, I sure am hungry. Don't, Don't let it be known that you're fasting. That's not the purpose of it. It is a spiritual purpose for us To be reminded, because whenever I'm hungry, my body will tell me, hmm, it's time to eat. It will give us a reminder. If I'm quiet long enough, somebody around you right now, their stomach will say, hey, I'm hungry too. Our body gives us that reminder. And whenever you have those barbarismous sounds and your body is telling you, hey, I'm hungry, and you feel that hunger pain, then your body says, hey, it's time to get up and go and eat. Fasting is using that experience as a reminder of something spiritual. It is a reminder, instead of eating, I'm going to pray. Instead of satisfying this physical hunger, I'm going to satisfy a spiritual hunger. And we know that Jesus did this for 40 days. 
So whenever we talk about fasting, the Bible says it is a reminder, and we're not to be deceitful about that. That's not what the Bible is telling us, but it is for a spiritual purpose. And the world knows very little about that. And fasting will teach you something about yourself really fast. It will teach you how dependent we are upon the appetites of our physical being. And I can grow real ashamed real quick whenever I find out that most of my peace comes from how I satisfy my physical appetites. And I need to be reminded of that, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This world lives by their appetites, do we? Philippians chapter 3 and verse 18 says, For many walk of whom I'm often told, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Romans chapter 16 verse 18 says similar. says, For such men are slaves not of the Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Fasting teaches us restraint. It teaches us that we are utterly dependent upon God. Folks, before you can ever stand and do anything for God in public, you've got to be willing to bow for, before Him in private. These students are about to go off to college. It's going to be a hard thing because... You're going to be busy. There are going to be assignments to be made. There are social activities you're going to be involved in. It is a great time of life, and it's going to be hard. But if you don't spend that time every day getting along with God, then you're not going to be prepared when you're challenged in your service to Him publicly. The second lesson is an obvious lesson, and that is that you are never safe in spiritual victory without being prepared for spiritual attack. Adrian Rogers, pastor at Bellevue for so long, used to say that uh, as soon as God opens a window of blessing, then Satan will open the gates of hell to blast you. Now, Jesus has just stood there at the Jordan. He's just been identified as the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. He knows what he's there for. He follows and, and tells John, I need to be baptized to submit to the Father. We know from the other Gospels that John kind of argued with him a little bit, but he said, I need to do this. He submitted to his Father's will. Heaven was ripped open. The voice of heaven came to him. The dove of uh, uh, the Spirit ascended to him like a dove ascends, and that Jesus was now led by the Spirit to go into the wilderness. What a great picture of physical um, submission, of spiritual victory. But now that he is tempted, Mark doesn't tell us, but the other Gospels do. Jesus was tempted, we know, three times. There were many, many times. These are just three examples, three different fronts. Jesus is confronted about the physical things. And there he has fasted for 40 days. After 40 days, his hunger has returned. He is hungry. And Jesus is man. He is hungry. And he is God. He has the power. And so Satan comes and says to him, why don't you use those powers that you have and turn these stones into bread? Jesus said, no, I'm not going to use my power just to benefit myself. Satan came to him a second time and said, he took him up to the pinnacle of the temple, and he said, why don't you do something in a public way? Because, you know, the angels come and protect you. I quoted, misquoted scripture to him. And, uh, and everybody will see, and you want to get everybody's attention, and why don't you do that? And Jesus said, no. And he quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And he said, no, I'm not going to use my power and I'm not going to do things that just draw to my own pride. And then Satan carried him up and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Look at all the vastness of the Romans. Look at the, at the wealth of wisdom found in China. Look at the riches of the Aztecs. Look at the world and all the kingdoms of this world. And I'll give it all to you. I think it's very complicated. But one of the things I think was greed. He was trying to appeal to that human nature of greed. You can have all this and it'll be so easy. And Jesus said no. I think whenever you stop and you think about whenever Jesus 
tells us and why the Bible tells us he was tempted because we need to understand this was part of God's redemption plan. There is never anything that you're going to face that God does not understand and that Jesus did not, Jesus did not overcome. But you will never be able to rest upon the victories at Jordan unless you're prepared to go to the temptations of the wilderness. And today is a glorious day for these seniors and for these students and for your families. And we look at those great days, but you're going to face days in the wilderness. And you're going to face temptations. And he who knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that we don't have a high priest who hasn't been touched like we have. He understands what we go through. But every time that Satan opens a door of temptation, you remember God gives you a way of escape. Sometimes, you know what you have to do? You have to run. You have to flee. And there are some times when temptation is so severe. It's like Joseph in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife came and tried to uh, seduce him, and he said no. And she grabbed him by the coat. He left her holding the coat, and he ran away. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22. 2 Timothy 2, 22 says, Now flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Sometimes you have to run. I would encourage you, don't put yourself in a situation that you're going to have to run away from. But there are times that you're just cast, and these students are about to be put in situations when you just have to walk away. But you have to walk to someone. You walk to the Lord. Flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness. But then there are times when you have to make a stand. I'm thinking about Joshua. He has been Moses' helper throughout the time that they came out of Egypt, throughout the time the the children of Israel were disobedience, and through their wilderness wanderings. And now then he stands at the place where he's about to enter into the promised land, and there are many, many battles that have to be fought. And this is what God comes to say to him. Joshua chapter 1. Verse 1, it says, Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to you, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. I share with you that there are victories spiritually for us, but we still have to fight the fight. We still have to put our foot down. We still have to walk the path. We still have to make the journey. But we make that journey relying upon God. He gives the boundaries. You'll have from the Mediterranean over to the Euphrates and from Lebanon all the way down to the Nile of of Egypt. And then in verse 5, he says, No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I've been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all that the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. How do you overcome Satan? You run away from those temptations. You go and spend time alone with God, and you listen to God's word. And then you let God's word be that defense against all temptation. Every time Satan came, Jesus could have told him just simply be quiet and commanded him. But instead, Jesus always brought the word of God. He always used the sword of the Spirit. That's why you have to be alone with God and his word so you'll be prepared when the battle comes. But don't rest on your laurels now because there's more battle to be done. James chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Martin Luther, there's a stain on the castle wall of where an inkwell was splattered against the wall. It said that Martin Luther, in battling in a spiritual battle with Satan, threw that inkwell at him. 
he found that there's a better way to defeat Satan than throwing inkwells at him. This is what Martin Luther wrote. He said, when the devil comes knocking upon the door of my heart and asks who lives here, the dear Lord Jesus goes to the door and says, Martin Luther used to live here, but he has moved out, and now I live here. The devil sees the nail prints in his hands and the pierced in his side, and he takes flight immediately. When I was a child, my childhood pet, when I was growing up, was a, a little part collie, part uh, border collie. And uh, she was a sandy color. We, we named her Sandy. We got her the summer before I went into uh, the second grade, and she died uh, the summer after my sophomore year in college. So she was my dog. She was my friend. And I've had other hunting dogs and other pets, but none like Sandy. And she was such a smart dog. My daddy worked with her a lot. She'd do all kind of tricks. She'd, she'd sit down and put her paws up on the step and he'd say play the piano and she'd act like she's playing the piano and throw her head back and howl and uh, she just did all kind of little tricks but my daddy would take a piece of meat and he would lay it on the ground and he would say no and she wouldn't even look at the meat she would look at my daddy daddy would say no even got to the place where he could take that meat and set it on top of her head and you could see that her eyes wanted to look up. Oh, she wanted it so badly. But Daddy would say, no, no. And then he would say, okay. And she'd throw it off and catch it in midair and eat that piece of meat. But you know what? It was as if she wasn't even tempted with that meat as long as she kept her eyes on her master. That is how we overcome temptation. We keep our eyes trained on our master. Let's pray. Father, we do celebrate with these students at an important crossroad in their life, a, a place of great accomplishment, but also a place a little frightening to look ahead, exciting to look ahead. And Father, we pray that, Lord, you will help them to learn.